Hello everyone, welcome to this week's Our World Today live discussion. We're very happy to be with you and we're going to talk about, as usual, the things that we thought were topical and important this week. So a little bit of a recap before we begin. Um, this week, one of the most um, curious things that happened was that Iran and Pakistan launched strikes at each other with Iran beginning the attacks. Both um, countries think that the other is supporting supporting rebel, rebel and terrorist groups inside their own territory. And also Iranian are pretty much irked by um, what is happening um, um, on the side of Israel and think that Pakistan is kind of supporting it. So we'll see how the situation developed. It seems like it's a little bit of a mess, but we'll see. And then um, the conflict is affecting the whole region and it's definitely a global conflict that is bigger than only Gaza, the Gazan Strip. And one of the things that this has brought up to the surface is the main topic that we are going to talk about today, which is Yemen and what is happening in Yemen, because there is a conflict that has been years long in Yemen and that has only been intensified by uh, the problems that we are having in the region right now. So this is our main topic. We'll follow with um, the phenomenon of aging across the US and some European countries and Japan and see if this is a good thing or a bad thing and discuss the advantages and the downsides. And if we have time, we'll finish with talking about the far right political group in Germany that is considered for banning because they want to do allegedly mass deportation. So let's get started on Yemen, because we have a lot to talk about. Would someone that watched the video that um, um, started this conversation like to do some kind of synopsis of the situation? Obviously, like not everything, because this is difficult, but um, just a little bit of a summary so that everyone can understand where we're at with Yemen. Yeah, um, I wouldn't mind. So yeah, basically, um, Yemen being like um, on the very kind of southern tip of the Arabian Peninsula, you know, it's right on the Red Sea. That's a major shipping corridor, like about 15% of global trade goes through the Red Sea. Um, but now some of that is being diverted all the way around Africa um uh the southern tip of Africa because the Houthi rebel group or whatever you want to call them um because they're now basically like the government of Yemen and they have been since 2015 they've been firing a bunch of missiles at um cargo ships and so that's been a real big issue and it's because um they what they say is that they are in solidarity with the Palestinian people in Gaza. Israel, you know, they've been, Israel has been like um, attacking Gaza in an attempt to root out Hamas um, since, you know, October. And so the, the Houthi um, rebels slash government have been saying we're going to fire rockets at any ships that are going to Israel or coming from Israel or associated with Israel. And um, it it's kind of complicated because I was hearing about those ships like have complicated ownership. Like, for example, there was this one ship that, so it docks on the Isle of Man, which is in the British Isles. It was, um, it was being contracted out by a Japanese company for shipping, but the ship itself was owned by um, some two guys, like one, I don't remember his nationality, but one was Israeli. And so it's like really complicated. 
like you've got like four different countries there, but Iran is, Iran is supplying intelligence to the Houthis. So Iran is telling them which ships to strike and when and why to do it. And um, they are, of course, giving them all of the weaponry and everything because Iran also has um, an interest in like um, promoting the Houthis because they antagonized Saudi Arabia, you know, and their rivals. So it's a big, complicated web of like the Game of Thrones in the Middle East. And now it's like really disrupting global trade. And people are, some people are worried about like prices of everything increasing because of that. And yeah, and so the British and the US have launched strikes on the Houthi military bases and, you know, other things associated with like their production of arms and stuff. And so the Houthis have doubled down and said now they're going to target any ship associated with also the US and the UK in addition to Israel. So yeah, it's pretty crazy. And that's that. And people are kind of debating, like, is this the right course of action? Should they do that? Um, how should they go about, you know, some because you a lot of people I've been hearing talk have been saying, like, you can't really remove them because it would be like another Afghanistan style conflict with, you know, guerrilla people, guerrilla warfare. And it's really complicated. And plus a lot of Yemenis but not all support the Houthis. Um, so yeah. And the U S also doesn't even have very good intelligence about Yemen because they haven't, it hasn't been a priority, you know, to really know Yemen with everything else going on. So it's making it really hard to like determine like where to strike if they want to. So yeah, I feel like that's a decent summary, but if you guys have anything to add, let me know and then we'll unpack what this is spiritually and what's going on here <laughs> yeah thank you Sage I am glad that you mentioned that people don't have a whole lot of intelligence in Yemen because it's the crisis there has been going on um for years now pretty much forever um at this point and it's not a lot of people took interest in it because there was no necessary, like, you know, there was no interest um, to act before. And that was kind of sad because um, one of the worst famines uh, the world has known and, and that probably a century is happening there. And uh, we really need to focus on that. Um, I think the lack of intelligence is just a call to have better presence and attention to these kinds of conflicts um, from the, I guess, the, the international political scene, um, from the side of the United Nations and what to do about them, even though the United Nations has been on soil for like years, like pretty much since the beginning of of the Houthi taking control of the government. Um, the only disturbing things from it is that people are so, I think this is the worst of application of taking sides um, that we're seeing right now in the Middle East. Like um, you think um, you're with my enemy, so I'm going to attack you. Um, you're not with me, so I'm going to attack you. And we attack and we attack and we attack without thinking. And there are so many casualties in the wake of that. And I, I think that's not okay. And that's such, you know, we live in such a complicated world where it's like, it's never black or white. And, you know, it's going to, it's not going to have implications only for the person you hate is going to have implications for many innocent people, even innocent people that are from the same nationality from the person you hate. And I don't understand this. Um, I don't understand this will to 
hate a whole ethnic group, but at the same time, the base of the conflict in Yemen is on ethnic hate. So that would just feel normal to them. And I think maybe that's where we need to focus spiritually is like, how can we go into hating a whole ethnic group to a point of causing wars? Like that, that would be my question. So Irina, I think just before your question, I think there's something else that we need to just add into the mix of information in the sense that the U.S. is has was previously put uh, previously put the Houthis on a global terror list and were prepared to put them on a foreign terror list. And subsequent to the inauguration of the Biden administration, they backtracked out of that decision because of the famine in Yemen and that it would be very complicated to provide humanitarian aid to the country if the Houthis that are that have a, almost a controlling presence in the country, specifically since they are in the capital, um, it, it, it would be very difficult for them to, to then provide humanitarian aid because it would almost become illegal under their national laws. So, in, in, you know, in the hopes of supporting the greater Yemeni people through their famine with humanitarian aid, they also have to probably relax their desire to act as strongly militarily as they would have liked to possibly. That's interesting. That gives us a lot of insights on how the conflicts are being managed. Maybe even the Gaza situation was being managed for years. Mm -hmm. I think also the other thing that was that's interesting that came out of the video was that the US cannot have too significant a presence in the Red Sea because they also have a presence in the, I think that the sea is off of China and Japan because of that almost, well, I'm going to call it the Asian equation, but there's a lot of animosity there. So they were, they've been needing to put a presence there. They're having to put a presence in the Red Sea. And then, of course, the presence of their support to Ukraine in this Russia-Ukraine conflict is probably going to be a significant drain on their defense resources and budget, which in essence has a significant impact as a, as a nation because they needing to funnel money in those directions, but also in the direction of supporting their own population. Yeah, there's many layers to this, like multiple layers. And I wanted to um, go to the core of the healing from the question that Irene had brought of how can we have such hatred towards another ethnicity? Like how can this be, such atrocities be taking, be happening right now? And I feel it's like, this unknowing that we are ultimately divine, like we are ultimately good, pure divine people. And we're just living in that illusion that the other person is wrong. If someone is attacking someone, the attacker feels that they're right in some sense. And the attacked also feels that they're right in some sense to like combat that or like in some way they are innocent. So that truth that everyone is truly innocent is not really grounded. It's not seen. And so the humanity is not seen. And then there's like layers upon layers of atrocity happening because we don't see the 
pure goodness that we were essentially created in. So interestingly, I like your point because there's something that just stood out to me in what you were saying in the sense that as you were speaking, there's, there's a, a component of them not being true to themselves. So not accepting their divinity, their sovereignty, but also almost withholding their own humanity from themselves. And therefore, there's the action of it being taken away through the actions of other people. Yeah, and um, yeah, it also it also brings up like, hmm, well, a lot. So, both everyone involved in this is kind of like saying that they care about you know humanity and the the well being of people and stuff. Like the Houthi um, people are saying, like they're doing it for Gaza. They're doing it to put like pressure on Israel, but really on like the entire West, but also like a lot of trade between Europe and Asia um, comes through the Red Sea. So this would also impact people in Asia too, like all kinds of countries, right? So yeah, I don't know, but yeah, it just really, I don't know, it makes you ask the question like, what is acceptable, you know, like what is like an acceptable way for them to like, you know, advocate their like cause basically. Like if they, they want to advocate for, you know, the people of Gaza and it's just like, well, is this like an acceptable way to do so? You know what I mean? Like, is this like a loving decision or is it just a way to, um, I don't know, just... It's just a strategic, to me, it feels just like a strategic thing. Like they're basic, it's basically like one piece in the puzzle of trying to like, I don't know, try to bring down Israel or something like that. But because Iran is involved and it feels more like that kind of thing rather than like a really a loving way to kind of intervene. Do you guys, do you know what I mean? Yeah. So. Yeah, it is. But it's Supposedly, this would like put pressure on on Israel to stop its, you know, huge invasion of Gaza. So, yeah. yeah, I just wonder if like um, the more we talk about it, the more I feel like Iran, Yemen, and everybody that is trying to intervene in the conflict has launched strikes at Israel or between each other. Um, it feels like, again, just like what we saw with Iran and uh, people just revolting against um, what happened at the end of last year um, or at the end of 2022, it feels like it's just another excuse for more power from the different countries. That's why, That's how it feels in terms of spirituality. Like it's not really about stopping everybody and, and fighting the devil. Maybe it is for some people. I think it is for the people, at least, who feel uh, very sensitive about um, being Muslim in a world where like, Muslim people aren't necessarily accepted everywhere, things like that. Um, but it also feels like for the government, that like, um pretext like can we say this in english like just um an instrument to gaining more control that's what i feel it is um something interesting that grandville mentioned is that the u.s um the u.s international marine forces would feel a bit stretched if they were to involve more people in the Red Sea and things like that, even though they increase their budget and other things. Um, I think spiritually, and maybe even in a positive sense, 
maybe that would be the beginning of a reflection on how to yes, how to distribute um armed forces in a better way in order to ensure um the global stability. Because we discussed that a few weeks ago. Like I don't think anybody would willingly relinquish um their you know their leadership um in terms of military forces and innovations and things like that. Uh, but maybe things where we can intervene, like things where we can't have like a second Afghanistan or things where even where you're the biggest armed force of the world, you can really send all of your troops there. Um, that would open the discussion to maybe having um, a balance that is different um, in the future, but that's maybe probably an opening question more than it is a, a real reflection um, on the side of the US right now, but maybe it is, I don't know. So something that strikes me as very interesting though is there seems to be a lot of discord being sown in some very almost not as advanced countries in the world. There's a lot of civil war happening in those Middle Eastern regions. There's a lot of battle for almost supremacy in all those areas. There's a lot of reliance on countries like the U.S., uh, countries that have, for lack of a better phrasing, greater influence uh, in terms of the United Nations, G8, G20, all of those kind of things. And it just uh, it kind of feels to me like all of this discord is almost a precursor to conversations that start to really put on the table the requirement for a world order that people can all subscribe to and that people can all support for the reason that there is a requirement for more people to get involved in creating stability. The problem is that the, the creation of the order of stability at the end it's being done through the exact opposite, the, the total contrast to that level of order and just, you know, greater cooperation and those kind of things. But I do feel like this is literally going to shift how, how politics are played out at a global level and might just be the unfortunate root of create the discord in order to sow the need for something else that actually installs more order so you know that that it's almost as if the world is learning through a significant amount of contrast I agree. There needs to be a new world order. And I wanted to highlight your point on accepting our own humanity and seeing our own humanity within. And I wanted to bring that question to you guys, like, what is the fear here that we feel? What is the fear here to accept our humanity and to accept our divine power? For me, I feel is there there might be a distrust that we may be a good neighbor, but our neighbors may not be. Or there's a feeling of like, I need to have a world domination because there's a lack in this world. And I need to, you know, make sure that I hoard enough weapons, hoard enough um, finances. What do you guys feel it is? Oh, yeah, this came up in, in TFAS last night, 
um, I'm pretty sure, didn't it, I say it? Because we were watching it together. And yeah, um, it came up some somehow. Jeff and Shalia were talking about this, how like, you know, most most people in the world feel like, um, yeah, yeah, like you're like innocence isn't powerful. You know, like they feel like you can't you can't be innocent because you're gonna be preyed upon and victimized, which isn't true because yeah, it just that's not like divine and everything. And so yeah, you don't have to be like not innocent in the sense of like, I don't know, willing to like, I don't know, like harm other people or um follow a selfish interest instead of like what's divine and what's loving. Like you don't have to do that. But also like it's not it's not necessarily a bad thing to, you know, put boundaries up against people who are choosing, you know, fear basically, like who are choosing separation. Like that's not a bad thing. In fact, um, it's a it's a compassionate thing. And that's like the opposite of what a lot of people might think if they think about this topic about like war you know, and everything like you're just like, well, I guess the true divine thing to do would be like, yeah, to not to kill anybody, you know, but it's just like, but there's like a difference between, you know, like murdering and killing and like, there's people who are so, they're so like hell bent on hatred or choosing separation that the literally the only thing they understand is is violence you know and so but you can still be maintain your innocence while fighting back against people who have evil intentions you know like it's like saying like yeah if someone like tries to come up to you or in your house and like you know harm you you're, you defending yourself doesn't compromise your innocence. So I think people have to know that and stuff. And we need to know too that like, there are certain boundaries that we put where like, if you want, if you have a disagreement, you're not going to go so far as to like, I don't know, attack random people doing business, disrupt the entire global order of trade. Russia has disagreements with Ukraine. You're not going to invade them you know, work your disagreement out a different way, which they never had any intention of doing, by the way. Well, I guess, yeah, Russia's way would be try to get, try to install like a pro-Russia president, which they which they did in Ukraine until he was overthrown, that guy, right? So that was their, their other way, their peaceful means. You know, it's just like, you have to put boundaries and say, no, you cannot do that. So yeah, so... I don't know. I feel like that's what it's about, you know. And I think a way of the U.S. putting a boundary is putting Hutus, Hutus back on the terrorist list. Hutus, right? I think it's Houthis, but I don't know. Houthis. <laughs> you guys know what I mean. You guys. Yeah. Um, putting them back into the terrorist list and unfortunately if Yemen cannot receive support because of this these are the consequences of putting boundaries I think there was a pretty much a respect of the international laws and the laws of war there about not going on the terrorist list if that would um, enhance the famine in Yemen, but the fact that Yemen intensified um, its instability by attacking um, ships in the Red Sea is probably going to trigger that new step. And I think a conclusion from what Sage was saying is that um, if someone doesn't know how to speak the language of of peace, sometimes you have to to meet them where they are. And that was very respectful of the West to not attack first. 
they they had no intention of attacking if they if they if not attacking was a possibility and but like if someone is attacking you or you know destabilizing like the global order well then sometimes to stop them you just have to intervene and then the challenge is going to be on um how to intervene without so much of an intelligence how to intervene when you can enter Afghanistan or Iran because of the past uh, catastrophes that happened there when you last intervened and um, how to resolve the global order without intervening in a country when you learn your lesson that sometimes intervening instead of having them, um, you know, just figure out their shit is just not going to be super good so lots of things to um consider and i think lots something lots of things that are going to happen this year that we're going to discuss i feel we're we're pretty complete about how we analyzed um, this situation and discussed it spiritually so would you like maybe well, and I just add a last point around something that Nadia asked in a, a question around the fear, because something that still st strikes me very strongly is that there's a lot of exercise of militant power on other people, but that exercise of militant power on other people often stems from people fearing their own power. So when you fear your own power, you're not likely to stand up to the bully and you're expecting somebody else to defend you. The fact of the matter is the bully is not going to back down unless you actually step into your own power. And as Sage said, you can have power in your innocence. And I think that is a very strong place for people to remember to be is that they need to still stand in their power. It does not mean that you have to exercise your, in your power in a way that suppresses another person, but they also need to understand that you will not accept their suppression either. Yep, that's a pretty good lesson. Yeah, and so moving on to our next topic, um, we are... Um, discussing the aging of humanity in certain countries at least um mostly in western countries like japan the us and germany and other countries and i'd like to if nadia you could maybe sum up the research that you found around this topic that would be great Yeah, there's research done in Pew Research article uh, stating that the U.S. will have a large population of 65 and older um, coming fairly soon within the next five to 10 years, I believe. And they did a comparison to Germany, Japan, and Italy. And it seems that although they do have a large group of um, 65 and older, uh, U.S. is expanding that and um, going above that exponentially. And it goes to the question of how are we doing this? How are we becoming successfully more um, older and like prolonging our life? And it gives us a perspective of what is older and what is true um, el elderly. Thank you. And so the spiritual component that we wanted to discuss there uh, was that obviously demographics is a little bit complex. Sometimes some countries go into periods of aging and um, decrease of births and then they come back and then other countries follow afterwards. It's not super linear and they don't go into the same stuff at the same time but usually there is a trend 
over a couple of years and decades. Um, the spiritual component here to discuss with the aging of humanity, because I don't think, even though it won't always be exponentially increasing, I don't think um, we'll have a younger um, population of people after that. I think the aging is going to continue. And some sources um, find it to be, and some government find it to be very worrying and daunting. Take France this week and uh, the president saying like, we need more births. <laughs> we need to be rearmed in uh, in citizenship <laughs> and things like that. And um, some, some people say that it's a good thing because people are living older in better health. And so what is it really pointing to spiritually for you guys? Yeah, yeah. Um, I feel like it's pointing to spiritually um, us overcoming death, you know, like we're overcoming the illusion of death. Like we know we're eternal beings, you know, we don't just stop existing and like why should we decay? Why should we decay? Like, why should we age? Why should we like retire and just stop contributing to the world and, and, and essentially stop living, like working all your life just to stop living basically sucks. It's such a horrible idea, you know, and you see people every day who are in that state or, or people who, like half of the retired people I ever talked to say that they couldn't stand retirement and they, they wanted to get out of it and do something, you know, and find some place in society where their expertise and everything that they've cultivated in their life could be of use. And I think that that's cool. And I feel like it, yeah, that, that's what it points to. And like the increasing longevity is also like increasing someone's um the vitality of people so like being in your 60s or 70s doesn't mean being decrepit it means you know you're gonna feel more youthful and the meaning of 60 or 70 should change with time so it shouldn't mean oh 60 70 like you're getting in your sunset years it should mean increasingly like where I don't know it's just you've been on the planet a while but who cares but there's like all these people who make posts and stuff on Facebook and express how they're like oh I'm getting close to 30 you know I'm gonna start getting lower back pain and I'm just like this is so this is absurd okay like but people should not like be fearing aging and stuff like that and I feel like um as the need for more and more older people to, you know, do something more in society, like to stay involved as that need increases, people's vitality in their older years would ultimately only increase because you're going to have more vitality if you have purpose, you know, and we all, that's common knowledge, like people in like nursing homes or whatever, like older communities who have some sort of purpose. They tend to improve in health and live longer. And I feel like that's going to be the trend. But yeah. And then some people are like, oh my God, it's so scary. We're going to have all these like older people unable to work or not wanting to work. And they're going to be like a burden on our societies and all of that. And that's like ego talking. That's like, yeah, not purpose of all this that's what i feel from this see i agree i think governments like in france um demographically france is like a little bit in advance from all countries we don't know why but it's always been that way so there is a decrease of birth right now after an aging of population um and it's it's scary for governments because it's like oh my god like we're going we're we can even, we have to push back the years of retirement. We can even pay them right now. Like um, we're going to have a majority 
of um, the country that is going to be inactive soon and we're going to have to pay for it and uh, that's not okay and things like that and people are pushing back on the other side it's like more births you're kidding like with inflation and uh, and the fact that we can't live um, in decent apartment in Paris um, without cutting off members <laughs> of ourselves like you know it's um it's a difficult discussion for people when they don't know the truth spiritually and the truth spiritually is that it's been proven that movement and cerebral activities and not going actually going to retirement is the way and of course like you're not going to say to someone that has been doing um physical activities all of their life to continue until their death we just need to have activities that are better suited for this part of the population, but still get them to want be active because that's all they want to do. Like I, I know like a lot of people that feel like they're bored and a lot of people that had, that had had health problem in my family after retirement is that it's because they don't move anymore. Otherwise, they were like pretty healthy, and it really felt like they stopped leaving because they feel like society don't have a use for them anymore, and they they just can start dying. And obviously, it's not a conscious source, but unconsciously, like, and sometimes consciously, like it's uh, hey, when when I'm done, like I'm going to do that and this and that, and it, we all have like a granny that talks like that I feel sometimes um but there's something there about I think I was watching a twin frame ascension school class as well and uh definitely I were mentioning watching that interview between like four um superstars of acting uh that were considered elderly and there was like Maggie Smith with them at the time, I think. Um, and I don't know the rest. I don't remember their names, but pretty like big superstars. Like everybody has seen them in movies, even when they're old, like they're pretty iconic when they're old in movies. And they have such, they live such a good life and they have such a love and they love their jobs. And because, because the society is, um, um, Telling them that hey, it should be time to consider um, to consider preparing your things for dying. <laughs> they were in their eyes. It was like hey, well, we're preparing to die. Like there, we lived a good life. There's been nothing more to do. Even though, like, I would love to see them in other movies. I think that their some of their best works were when they were older. You know, so I think it speaks to the fact that there is so much like you can still give so much to society, even when you're elderly. And I think because people didn't live that long um, in life before um, the 20th century, like in terms of humanity and how to manage everything we're still coming up to terms with how to manage living with a longer life. That's what I feel. So, yeah. I also think there's the, there are a couple of other considerations as well. So yes, they start to decline because they feel like they have no purpose. But we also must remember that there is a requirement. And yes, we have moved forward technologically and in many other spheres exponentially and those advancements haven't been necessarily the work of people that have been in their fields for long periods of time and shy away from the energy of innovation so there is a balance in society to be st still to be struck from a point of view of the elders of humanity helping the youth of humanity 
settle into their humanity, but there's also the space of the elders of humanity are not likely to go and play around with all the gadgetry and find newer and faster and smarter ways of doing things. So there is still a requirement to almost bring those two pieces back together. So you don't want the person that's going to say, we've always done it this way and it works this way and there's no need to change it. And then you also don't only want the person that says, throw the baby out with the bathwater and start over again. Because no, we have purified water so much more and purified bathing and showering and everything else that there's no need for the for the drain to be so wide that the baby is thrown out with the bathwater kind of stuff. So you kind of need to actually bring these two almost into communities of practice so that they are these the sharing of skills and the cross-pollination of this knowledge. Because one of the things is that as these advancements happen in technology, they go in, they, they can very easily go into advancements in how we work with the land so that the climate struggles reduce so that we produce at a smarter, faster, healthier rate. So, and all of those advancements has also been why people actually physically feel more vital. There's a lot more removal of dangerous minerals from food, which is obviously going to allow your cells to regenerate at a better rate and therefore last longer it's just science so there's a lot of art and science to life and it's nice that there's a there's a longevity component to it but there is also a component of there is a requirement for a level of mortality and a higher level of birth rate to kind of balance things out there has to be a range you can't have you can't have the one end of the rainbow with the without the other because then there's no rainbow. Yeah, for sure. But like all of this is like um, rebalancing, um, making sure that your consciousness is good and that you still choose life even after a while and things like that. All of that is like communication blocks, relationship blocks. And if we go into the communication and relationship blocks, we realize um how that rebalancing can naturally happen like we don't have to control it and mm -hmm. you don't have to force anybody to to go like completely against the grain of everybody everything they've known like they come really to change in their own way in their own journey they evolve as well they continue the thing is like they continue to evolve even after um, a time period where society don't considers people to be evolving anymore, they consider them to be decaying. So they completely revolve um, by their healing, hopefully, um, our, our sense of being older in a community. Yeah, it's beautiful, really, to see that we are bringing in more life force within ourselves that are is increasing in our longevity. And there could be multiple reasons for it. Of course, when you look at the spir spiritual aspect, when you're working your life purpose, you're giving that um, life force back to you. And we can also see, like, in our healthcare, we've done so well in medications and resolving issues that people are living long longer lives and the quality of life is determined on you and how you want to bring about that life force and give that back to you and i also feel that um there was a question about yeah, I forgot it. So maybe it'll come back to me. Um, but yeah, I just find it really beautiful that we are 
oh, that that's what it is. So I feel that that question that the U.S. government has and most governments have is like, what are we going to do when the community gets older is an extension of or a reflection of our own individual question of like, what are we going to do when we get older? Of course, we have that answer, our life purpose. But those who are unsure or don't know this practice, they're probably questioning themselves of how we can support ourselves in that age. And that brings them into a deeper level of intimacy with God, because they are asking God, how can we um, support ourselves? How can we fulfill ourselves? And it goes into a deeper knowing of their life force and their life purpose. So I think that fear question and that lack um, coming out and getting um, upheavaled as we are experiencing is really doing a benefit for us that we are questioning what we're really here for and how we can live a quality fulfilled life. Oh, I feel that after uh, COVID that really jump-started us because we got that opportunity for introspection. And so people were just like, you know what? I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna be that content, cr content creator. I'm gonna start my own business because they realized that they couldn't rely on their nine to five or where wherever, however they were working. And they were seeing that like the government didn't have answers to these like newfound questions, newfound um, challenges that were arising. So a lot of us uh, took it upon ourselves to go deep and dive into like, how can we support ourselves? Like regardless of if the government can support us or not, like how can we support ourselves? And it always goes down to like us um, finding our, true purpose and happiness. Yeah, seems like, <laughs> seems like um, it was a nice conclusion and um, you're right about that. Um, should we talk a little bit about Germany and this, um, I'm not going to say ridiculous story, but the story about um, mass deportations. And I guess a lot of the things that European and Western countries are facing with their far right movements and wanting to just like um, forbid immigration um, altogether. And the fact that Germany is considering banning this um, far-right political party that is like the challenger to the Democrats party there um, because they kind of want to mass deport people. And uh, yeah, Grenville, do you want to talk a little bit about it and what you felt was the spiritual lesson there? So I do need to apologize because that one I'd actually missed. So I can't really talk about it. Oh, sorry. I thought you were the one that. Oh no, I was. I was the. See. that one. My bad, <laughs> Sage. That one, yeah, that one is interesting. It really connects to the previous story about the aging because one antidote to an aging population that. Western countries have employed, particularly Canada and the US is immigration, you know, and but a lot of it has been like refugees coming from the Middle East, right, and stuff like that. So anyway, but I feel like it's fueled a lot of the sentiment that's nationalist and xenophobic, or, you know, it's pricked up all of these like, nasty sentiments and people and fears about their culture eroding so but this organization that does investigative journalism called collective in in germany um or it looks like corrective but without an e at the end um supposedly 
this is so this entire all of this all of this protest in Germany about the AFD party Alternative für Deutschland has been based on this one report from this organization. They had an undercover reporter in this hotel who overheard and took these grainy photos of um, these far right German politicians and some center right German politicians from a major party meeting with this this far right guy from Austria and apparently they were talking yeah about the mass deportation like saying hypothetically if we were to come into power how would we deport all these like these immigrants and these like people who have an immigrant background in Germany or these unassimilated people who are you know supposedly problematic to them and so from this report from these people assuming that their report is accurate which it may or may not be but I guess people believe them um there have been these huge protests across Germany like hundreds of thousands of people um but there's it's not I don't think it's likely that the party would be banned because it has such a support in Germany right now and it would probably create more backlash like it's illegal for a party to subvert democracy and I don't know if you can add ac you can accurately say like oh they're trying to subvert democracy you know just from that but it is German, a lot of Germans are pushing back against it. So that's basically what's happening. And there's a lot of like apprehension or just standing against anything that's like fascist, you know, like that or authoritarian in Germany, which is understandable. Yeah, that's why that's what I was going to say. The reason why it's struck um it struck a deeper chord in Germany than in any other countries or this may be happening is because World War II is not even a hundred years old. Um, and yeah, it's just like, it's too sensitive for some people. It's probably a show as well to the AFD that um, I think, the, I guess the democracy is going to be strong enough to gatekeep them if they try to do that. So I think even if they're not banned, it was pro potentially a nice warning for them. I guess too, like, you know, they have a reputation where people will believe a report that they were overheard talking about mass deportation. So one way or another, like, you know, it's it's probably an accurate vibe. Yep. Yeah. Do we know of any tension within ethnic groups or, or different cultures that would lead to this decision on any side? Yeah, um, Turkish Turkish immigrants from the second part of the 20th century and uh, all the refugees that have been coming from Africa and Syria in the past few years because of the civil unrest and that are all over Europe that tried to cross to the UK and that has been an everlasting problem for the past decades for us. And that would potentially trigger far right groups into trying to take action and um, have stricter immigration laws, which is happening, which is happening kind of all over Europe, like in the Netherlands, a little bit in France, not too much, but still. And um, yeah, these are just this is just a trend right now, and you know, just seeing how. Um, I guess you can test the limits of all these things from each country, what people are ready to accept or not. Um, and because of Germany's history, um, I think it would be taking it too far for that for them. So we'll have to see how this trends um, evolves during the year because it's kind of, it's a little bit of a point of tension for everybody. And with that, we have reached our hour. It was, this was a very enlightening discussion. Thank you for everyone who watched us live and is watching us on YouTube with replay. Um, if you enjoyed 
that discussion. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and share so that we can produce more of them and have more of these interesting things to talk about. And we'll see each other next week. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.